I haven't gotten your thoughts on the market's reaction, whether you consider the ETF a success. I, I, I had Ryan and Scott in our crypto town hall have a pretty heated argument. They he, he, all, both did a YouTube channel and they both had thumbnails. I tweeted about it. Rand's thumbnail is ETF was a major failure or something along, along those lines. Or ET, Bitcoin ETF failed or something. And then Scott's like, Bitcoin ETF, a massive success. They both had different thumbnails and they did their live at the same time. And then they had a pretty uh, heated the, the panel as a Friday night last week, I think. Where do you stand on the topic in the market's reaction? Yeah, I think it's... Um... I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a success, and I think what will be, what matters is maybe what happens over the long run. Um, so I'm definitely more in the, the camp of, you know, kind of slow build. Uh, you know, a lot of crypto is about building, you know, building quickly. Uh, but uh, you know, I think the whole story of Bitcoin has been, you know, just the, it's been one of the best performing asset classes of uh, since its inception. Um, so you know, I'm looking forward to Main Street getting more acquainted with it. You know, I think it's still. You know, uh, in some circles, it's still fringe, uh, which is hard to believe given given how well it's performed and given also, you know, how much uh, how much of an impact it's made. But when you think about the entire market cap of Bitcoin, I mean, it's still, you know, it still pales in comparison to other asset classes like gold and other things. So I'm looking forward to having it, you know, uh, continue to progress. So I think it's a success and I think it's just going to take time. But were you surprised by Vanguard blocking access to the ETF? Uh, no, I think there's always these like little hiccups, right? That happen. I mean, there's so much stuff going behind the scenes. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, you have the whole GPTC thing with, uh, you know, DGC, um, and how much, you know, fees they're charging Yeah, people like to give out how to allocate assets. So, I mean, none of this is really all that surprising. Yeah. Um, I've got Kenny. Oh, Kenny's already up on the stage. Let me follow you, Kenny. Um, we've got Carol here and I think some speakers are dropping out. It's glitching a bit. Um, let me get Noah up as well. Um, and your thoughts on the market's reaction as well, uh, Eugene, as I get up more more panelists. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot of debate about this, but I mean, this is like one of the two, right? It's not like this was unexpected. There was like one camp that's like, oh, this is going to be a huge uh, tailwind for big price pushes and others saying, hey, you know, it's going to drop um, just because that's classically what often what happens, right? Drop on the news. Um, so it looks like it was the latter, uh, at least as of now, uh, sort of the knee-jerk reaction. But, uh, you know, I really think the the time will tell, right, With all as with all of, it, all, as with all of these things. Yeah, we did have uh, uh, James on stage. He dropped out. We've got Noah as well, who just dropped out to get a big, bit of a market update. But as the rest think? of the panel... What do you think, Mario? What do you think, Mario? Um, I, 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 it's, it's so ingrained in me to try to be unbiased. That I, I don't give thoughts on even the lamest topics. But uh, you know, to break that, I, I think it's a success. Like The numbers speak for themselves. Uh, the GDBT, GBTC... Um, um, our flaws, I think they're an anomaly. I don't think they should be mixed up in the in the numbers when looking at the performance. A Vanguard blocking access was surprising, though. Um, you know, we're talking when you have the number one, um, Larry Fink, you go out and become an evangelist for crypto, and then you've got the number two do the complete opposite. It just shows that it's not trade fires. Like they're all waiting for 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 for, for having for for the ETF or being able to access Bitcoin, and they're all going to flood in. Um, so that was surprising to me. Um, Others were not as surprised, and he got led. He started a movement. He started the uh, the, the boycott Vanguard uh, hashtag. Got that trending uh, a couple of days ago. So so we'll see if he gets sued. But that was surprising to me. Um, I don't know why it wasn't surprising to you. That that came. Uh, uh, your thoughts on it were surprising as well. Well, but, I, I um, think I think it's like TradFi. I mean, I'm actually surprised TradFi is embracing Bitcoin as much as it is, given that it's like a true disruptive innovation, right? But I do think that. With any disruptive innovation, you got the new folks like Coinbase who are going to succeed, and then you've got you know the people who are going to be left in the dust, right? And I guess time will tell. We'll see what Vanguard does over time. But I think um, the people who don't embrace you know this new innovation are going to be left left behind. Uh, I think TradFi. I mean, I used to be in TradFi, so people are just very threatened by this new type of thing, you know, digital money. So, um, but with so yeah. with with, with, mm -hmm. with the feeling of being threatened by crypto, would that outweigh the the the, the FOMO? Uh, when they see the price spike up as it has over the last few months and the last few bull markets, like wouldn't making money outweigh everything? That's the most important thing, even for people in trade. For try and I remember Scott even said in our space, like Mario, you don't understand how degen TradFi could get. You, you expect TradFi to kind of clean up crypto. If there's no regulation, there's these meme coins pumping, these projects, tokens pumping uh, left, right, and center. <laughs> they're not going to criticize it. If they've got the ability to make money off it, they will. And I've seen that. And I've seen some of the, the most conservative investors FOMO into some sh shitty projects that were launching and doing a 10x at launch in the last bull market. Um, and I've spoken to these guys. Um, so that was Scott's position. Um, but the, yeah, my question to you is like, making money, isn't that more important than uh, 
than uh, being scared of the disruption that, that the technology brings? I, I think it is. But, um, you know, I mean, crypto gets a lot of, I, I think, a lot of love from, you know, from, from some of the DGen energy. But the, the reality is, if you look at like a market cap, it still has a long way to go, right? I mean, this is still a sub trillion dollar, at least Bitcoin is, you know, at the class. I mean, I, you know, I think it's going to, you know, that's not going to stay that way for long. Uh, it's had its ups and downs. But, um, you know, there's a lot of things like you know, unsexy things like commodities, derivatives, and you know, FX and other things that, you know, all these people are pretty busy with, right? So I think they're going to, you know, I think they're going to, uh, some sectors are going to continue to ignore it, thinking, hey, there's not an opportunity here until it, you know, as Bitcoin always does, continues to, continues to hit the face with uh, price gains until that market cap yeah. really starts to, you know, bridge gold and things like that. Yeah, um, I just don't want to kick off the space. And one thing we're going to start focusing on more with our content, we're creating a lot more content. We, we, we get, we've got some surprise announcements that will be coming in. I'm talking just purely crypto right now. Um, and one thing we're going to start focusing on something I haven't done ever and on the last bull market or the bear market starting to talk about projects that are interesting narratives that are interesting and talk about what we're investing in or what we're excited about and this is the first example of this um, and i'll be hosting the ones i really like i'll be hosting them on my account uh, personally as well but matt is one of those examples but we're going to be focusing on not just matter but now focusing on on layer twos in general what that means why is that exciting you know for people that are not deep into crypto why are layer two the next exciting thing after you know bitcoin and eth i know that's a very simplistic question for people deep in the industry uh, but i think a lot of people that are learning uh, would find that uh, useful matter the account matter i've sent you through an invite to come up as well so you just gotta accept that um and we've got terence nick and i see a few speakers dropping in and out it's glitching it was glitching for us earlier so if that's happening just check your dms from my account or from uh, crypto town hall which is the co-host and you'll be uh, you'll be able to accept and come up as speaker, but uh, let's kick it off. I actually, uh, I said I was usually I kick off every topic with going to Eugene and getting his thoughts, but uh, I'm going to go to you, uh, Kenny, and, and and me and Eugene and anyone else could ask you questions, and then for the rest of the jump in on the topic as well. It's just going to be a discussion. It's not going to be a Q and A or anything. But Kenny, I want you to kick it off um, before getting into Manta. Just more general for the audience. Why should they even care about L2s? What the hell are L2s? Keeping it as simple as possible. Yeah, sure. So, hi, everyone. I'm Kenny. I'm one of the co-founders of Manta Network. And uh, why should people really care about L2s? Because, you know, we're, we're all really talking about Bitcoin right now and maybe some conversation around Ethereum as well, especially because of all the... ETF news that's going on, right? But at the end of the day, what really is valuable on the blockchain is transfer of value, right? Like the whole point of Bitcoin is so that you can have Bitcoin, you can transfer it to someone in a peer-to-peer -peer manner, right? Like no one in the middle, right? But um, that transfer is actually very slow. I don't know how many people have actually tried doing this that are in the audience, but when I send Mario, you know, uh, 0.01 Bitcoin, that transfer takes at least 10 minutes. Right. Imagine buying a coffee and standing in front of the Starbucks line, waiting for 10 minutes to confirm your transaction for a coffee. Right. So so Bitcoin is what we consider a layer one. And Ethereum is the same way. Ethereum is also considered a layer one. It's faster than Bitcoin, but it also is not so um, fast in itself. And on top of that, the cost of being fast on a layer one is very expensive. And so layer twos are essentially networks that are built on top of Bitcoin, built on top of Ethereum to speed up and scale out those transactions. And so instead of doing your transaction directly on Ethereum, now you can buy a coffee directly through an L2 and that significantly cuts the time into seconds rather than minutes. And so you can buy your coffee in seconds at Starbucks with a layer but then, two. But, but Kenny, but yeah. what about L1s that have the ability to transact within seconds of Solana, Polygon being two, oh, Solana being one example, Cardano being another? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there's always this trade off between speed and decentralization on uh, the L1. So the more quote unquote decentralized you want to become, the slower uh, the transactions are going to be. And this is just for security reasons. And so Bitcoin and Ethereum are arguably the most decentralized networks in the world. And by that right, they are also, you know, some of the slower ones. Um, and so, you know, if you are thinking about more centralized solutions, right, then you get into this whole realm of like, why not just use Visa? Why not just use MasterCard, right? Like there's a, there's a lot of sort of questions around that that can really arise. But like, you know, if you're really comparing from like a purely decentralized players perspective, the L1 side, right, Bitcoin, Ethereum, I think the security on that side is definitely uh, incomparable. 
right? Like, I mean, Solana, for example, right? Like they, they have a great ecosystem, but at the same time, we've seen the network go down several times, right? But we've never really seen Bitcoin or Ethereum actually go down. Uh, I've having actually, sense. yeah, I saw, I saw Luke, I see you in the audience, they're putting thumbs down. Uh, I always like good debates. So I've actually sent you an invite if you want to come up on stage and tell us why. I don't know if you're... Okay, I've just sent you an invite. Okay, you came up. I thought you were going to leave. Luke, wh why all the thumbs down in the audience, man? And, and by the way, just for people in the in the audience, you can comment in the bottom right corner. At the same way I look at emojis, I go through the comments. And uh, I want to get your thoughts, obviously, on the ETF. I forgot to ask you earlier. And I always look at those comments to get the sentiment, the, the ETF, the markets, but also L2s and, and whether you agree with, with Kenny and others. And I'm one of them um, on that. L2s will play a big part of the future. But Luke, you don't agree with that. Why? Yeah, so wasn't expecting an invite. Thank you for the invite, Mario. Uh, I, I really don't think Ethereum should be lumped into the same bucket as Bitcoin. Ethereum is not decentralized. Ethereum has had its monetary policy changed on eight occasions by one ruler at the head of their central bank called Vitalik Buterin. I believe Ethereum recreates all of the problems of fiat, which Bitcoin was designed to fix 15 years ago. Okay, Bitcoin is the only thing that's decentralized. We have 200,000 nodes all around the world actually voting on consensus. Ethereum, no, 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 there's not 200,000 node runners around the world in Ethereum. Instead, you've got stakeholders. So, so, but it, so Luke, in your, sorry to, to interrupt, Jen, for anyone that's not too deep, obviously, it's, it's very, the crypto is still polarized, even though you find it as a small community from the outside. And, and there's a massive polarization when it comes to whether there's any other blockchains other than Bitcoin that can be truly considered decentralized. So in your position, Luke, and, and maybe I'd like I'd like Kenny kind of touch on that as well. But in your position, that the the only decentralized blockchain is Bitcoin. The second best one that I have some a lot of Bitcoin uh, um, um, Bitcoin OGs, uh, Bitcoin Maxis, um, admit this. The second one, they still don't agree with it that ETH is decentralized. It is the second best out there. Um, but your argument, there's still nothing out there that could be considered decentralized. Um, other than, than Bitcoin, which is, we're just getting a lot of love and a lot of attention. Uh, I've muted you, Luke. You got a bit of feedback. Kenny, your 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 thoughts on this? Because Bitcoin is getting a lot of attention, a lot of capital flowing into the ecosystem over the last 12 months. Uh, Kenny? While we wait for Kenny, I can jump in just quickly to answer that, Mario. So yeah, I'll, 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 I'll go. Okay. I like it. Okay. I like it. I like, I like, I like the confidence. I, I, I like, usually hey, when I bring Luke. up an audience member, they shy. This is Luke's taking over. Hey, go ahead, Kenny. Can you, Luke, can you tell us where, where, on, the, where on the doll the uh, Ethereum touched you? Yeah. <laughs> I can it down pretty simply. I mean, 30% of Ethereum stakeholders are censoring transactions. That's not decentralized, and I can't run a node in Ethereum. It costs me thousands of dollars if I want to run a very specialized computer in Ethereum. So I look at decentralization very differently. If it can be shut down by a government or if its monetary policy can be changed by a small handful of individuals, that's not decentralization. Wait, so look, look I, have, I have something for you. So, so don't use it, man. Be, uh, just, just don't use it. No, we want to protect scammers right? from being, from, we want to protect people from being scammed by scammers. That's why we speak out, right? It's, there's this continual well, pump your... and dump. There's this continual pump and dump on retail, the poor and middle class around the world by people who scam and that's some of you guys on stage yeah but i think i think people but the same the same but yeah but guys the same people that could scam uh, just in terms of crypto in general the same people that could scam could scam on any blockchain the, if, the, if you're talking about a blockchain being decentralized that means you're opening it up for anyone to do whatever they want on there no one could determine who launches a project on there so if anyone goes on big bitcoin ordinals let's go through all the projects launching on ordinals would you would you be happy to vouch for every single project on there. Will some of them be scams? If you're happy to vouch for each one of them out there, put out a tweet, and, I, and I'd love to, to see how that ages. Um, so that's when it comes to decentralization, it comes opposite of uh, stopping scammers. But Eugene, I know you were jumping in as well. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Bitcoin and Ethereum both, right? But obviously, originally got into Bitcoin, you know, like over a decade ago. And um, even that said, I mean, think about the block size wars a few years ago where a small group of people, you know, the Bitcoin core developers, you know, had a whole ton of power and it was like the developers versus the miners. And these were small groups of people. So not saying that um, the arguments that Luke made are completely incorrect, but, you know, I, I think the arguments he made were actually directly incorrect. Um, but I know we have a lot of crypto. I mean, I would love to hear other people speak. I know a bunch of people were, were jumping in, um, maybe Maddie. Uh, I heard you jumping in about this. But also, like, before, before you jump in, I mean, I want to frame the debate. This is not a Bitcoin versus Ethereum debate. I mean, that's a great space to have. It's its own space. 
But I think we're also talking about layer two, so I don't want to get too off track, right? Because I think Mario brought up a great point about ordinals and things like that, uh, which we have been pretty active in as well. Uh, but Maddie, why don't you jump in? Yeah, I've done. But just before you jump in, Maddie, and, and I've done spaces on ETH, uh, sorry, Bitcoin versus everyone else, and, and they do get extremely heated. They remind me of the, the political spaces I do in the US. Um, and, and the ones I, I enjoy, I used to do them a lot in the bear market. I enjoy those spaces, and they're good ones. And I'm a big fan of the Bitcoin ecosystem, invested a lot. Uh, and before you go, Maddie, actually, on that point, though, Kenny, I'll ask you a direct question, then we'll go to Maddie. When it comes to decentralization, how, how can you talk about it a bit more when it comes to, uh, uh, to Manta? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, in terms of the decentralization spectrum, right, like I think like Luke had touched upon some really good points and I do want to kind of cover this as well, right? Like I, I do think that there's a distinguishment between decentralization and censorship, both of which are problems that do need to be solved in the blockchain space, right? But like they are uh, technically, right, independent problems to be solved because you still could have a decentralized network where, you know, the governance still votes to censor, you know, transactions. Um, and then at the same time, right, like I do believe... And, you know, me, myself, I've, I've been uh, or I was a Bitcoin miner in the early days. Um, I do believe that Bitcoin has become quite centralized, right? You can argue, yeah, sure, there's like 200,000 nodes or something, whatever the metric may be in this space. But I mean, how many of those are run in your own home, right? I mean, who here runs Bitcoin nodes on their own computers right now? So, so right? I think None of us. Between a Bitcoin node and a Bitcoin miner. The hash rate is quite centralized, but you can anyone can write it. I think with a with a node, you need five hundred gigabytes, and you can just write it up, running off a hard drive. Right, but the node itself is just for looking at the the chain, right? Whereas the the transactions themselves are written by the miners, right? And so, like the the writing itself, right? The the transactions, the everything that happens is essentially determined by the miners. And so, in that case, right, like how how many of us are actually running? everything ourselves, right? I, I do think that like the, the, the generation of Bitcoin decentralization has actually kind of gone a little bit backwards. And now we see massive mining farms that are actually really taking over. And going to the to original question that Eugenie kind of pivoted to is going back to L2s and I'll, I'll kind of dig into what they mean, but also why they're exciting. Maddie, um, uh, Eugene was giving you the mic on your thoughts when it comes to layer twos and um, and um, whether you think they'll be getting more attention, like the TVL is locked in some of the top, uh, I think, Manta. You guys are just under a billion. I think you'll hit a billion when you when you launch, but you're, I'm not sure, do I still sound robotic? Uh, if I sound robotic, Eugene, just jump in and let me know. My headset plays up sometimes. Um, you kind of, you oh, that's much better. Yeah, yeah, I've just yeah, removed, I've removed my headset. But yeah, well, what I was saying is that, um, you know, the, the money seems to be flowing into L2s. I think we've got the, the top L2s right now. I've got the list um, here in front of me. We've got the number one sitting, Arbitrum at $11 billion. Optimism at 6TVL as total value locked. Amidus is at 991 and Manta's at 900. Now, the reason I said, so you're at top four. I think you'll be, you haven't launched your token yet. I think you're launching it in two days. So you've been top three. But that's a lot of capital that's being locked into those uh, layer twos. And I know Rand talked a lot about layer twos on his show and, and in, our, in our crypto town hall. But Matty, your thoughts on that narrative on L2s uh, playing a big role as, uh, as the, the uh, industry continues to mature? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mario. And, I, and it was a bit weird. I was, and, and thank you for keeping it on topic because suddenly, like, you know, I, I was invited to a, a space about uh, layer twos and suddenly the, the Bitcoin maximalists come in and try to shit all over everything like they normally do. Um, listen, the scammers are fiat money and the bankers, okay? Uh, layer twos, Ethereum, other, they're not the scammers. The, the, the fact of the matter is blockchain is much more transparent. So there are many, many more, infinitely more scams happening uh, through traditional finance than there ever will be on blockchain. The thing about blockchain is we get to find out who the scammers are in real time and say, hey, you're a scammer. Hey, everybody, that guy's a scammer. Hey, don't use those. Th you, these are the red flags. And everybody has equal access to information, whereas in traditional finance, those things uh, get shoved under the rug and nobody ever knows about them. All of those fines that uh, Jamie Dimon um, you know, has accrued over the years. Those are the only the only, only the times that he got caught. To answer your question, to answer the question, what are yeah, layer twos? Layer twos. Yeah, go ahead, Manny. Is actually Vitalik put out a, a wonderful blog, blog many years many ago years about ago the about trilemma of blockchain. You have to Mario. You got feedback. It's not coming Someone from me. I mute myself and I still heard it. 
Yeah, someone has to be back. Okay. Hey, I've, 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 yeah, I've, I've, I've muted it. Is it, is the echo still there? It's good now. Oh, no, I think it's, it's good fine. now. Ah, uh, cool, cool. Yeah, you okay. were saying what Maddie is. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, it, go ahead, answer the question, and then David, I'm going to go to you next. Is, is well, I'm curious, you and Carol, I guess, like, it, when it comes to tried to fight, is there interest? Are people talking about L2s, or is that too deep into the crypto rabbit hole? Because obviously, everyone's talking about Bitcoin after yeah. the ETF. ETH ETF is getting sexy as well. Um, so I'm curious on whether some in the tried fight world, Nick as well, I'll go to you in, in a bit, on whether they're talking about L2s as well. Go ahead, Maddie. The trilemma of blockchain is. You cannot have in tandem scalability, uh, transaction speed, and security. So those three things, um, you can only push one direction at a time where it's going to reduce some of the other words, other, other things, right? Um, so it's very difficult to scale even something like uh, Bitcoin. And we're seeing now, I mean, uh, I think Kenny mentioned it takes you 10 minutes to confirm a Bitcoin transaction. Kenny, clearly you haven't sent any Bitcoin lately. It takes nearly a day and a half unless you're paying $50 for the transaction fee. Um, so it's regular, a store of value for me now. <laughs> it's become a yeah, store I, of value. I, 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 sent, I sent one the other day. It took nearly 40 hours to confirm, and that was on, uh, you know, uh, uh, like $8 transaction fee. So it, it's, it's, it's virtually, you can't use it to send $15 around the world anymore like you could a year ago. Um, but the point about L2s is that what they do is they come and bring more blockchains into the mix. And the more blockchains we have, um, the more the people, the new people who are coming into blockchain and using it on a regular basis, um, we're able to distribute the load among many different blockchains. And I believe that, you know, in the future, we're going to see a lot more multi-chain and cross-chain uh, technology. Those are certainly some of the more exciting things that I'm building right now. Um, to where we get to the point where it's it's not just one chain, but rather like a mesh of blockchains put together that work interchangeably, and with and that's how we scale with these type of yeah. L twos and side chains. I just wanna I just wanna jump on that, Maddie, because I totally agree with you, right? Like I think we're we're honestly kind of getting closer and closer to like a cloud computing model, right? Like when you deploy some type of Web two application, right? I'm sure everyone in this space knows or has heard of something like Duolingo, right? The app that teaches you how to speak different languages. Like that thing's got 10 million users every single day. Actually, it's probably more now. I think it's like 16 to 18 million users every single day. Whereas, you know, blockchain on Ethereum, right? Like we, we see like 300,000 to 500,000 daily active users, right? And even that amount of transaction volume can't really scale. And so now we're, we are thinking, oh, L2s are that next solution for scalability. And I agree. I think they are a temporary solution, but ultimately, right? Like in order to really capture 10 million, 16 million daily active users, then you can't just depend on one specific L2, but you have to think about this mesh concept that you're talking about, Mehdi, like essentially it's horizontal scaling, right? How do all the L2s work together to provide the most scalability for the applications that need them the most? And I, I really like the way Absolutely. that and actually the numbers, the numbers are pretty astounding um, when you think about it, especially about scalability, a few hundred thousand to a few million. I guess the question is then, you know, a lot of the, um, Maddie was talking about, you know, the stats per V-byte or the, you know, unconfirmed transactions and the fees to confirm on L1 on, on Bitcoin. But of course, you have things like Bitcoin ordinals driving that, right? And, you know, you had laser eye maxi earlier, but we're talking about things like people wanting their, you know, JPEG, their PFP on chain, and therefore, you know, ordinals being, you know, way to, you know, way to sort of, um, you know, to reflect that. So I guess there's kind of like competing forces, right? There are people who say, hey, you got to have things on chain. Right. Otherwise, it's not, you know, you have something on an AWS server in Virginia somewhere. It's not really yours, which I think is a fair argument. Uh, but you're talking about scalability. So I'd love for you to touch on that, Kenny. Yeah, I do think it is a balance, right? I think that like a lot of a lot of times when people throw out qualitative terms like decentralization, for example, right, it's it's really one relative and two, not really measurable. Right. Like it's it's to the point right now where I think that the Web3 ecosystem, the blockchain space is really trying to find more of a balance. And I think, you know, like the solutions that, you know, NFTs kind of settle on right now, unless you're really doing ordinals and, you know, putting all that data on chain um, is something that is kind of a, a solution to that balance. Right. I don't think that it's a permanent solution. I agree. I think that will eventually transition out of that. And I think things such as like data availability solutions that are available right now, I guess I'm getting too technical there, but like the, the whole point is that like there are solutions being built to start thinking about how we can pay, place data on chain without having to pay the exorbitant cost. Because at the end of the day, right, like even with Ethereum, 
it's a global computer. It's not a global Dropbox. And so if you just want to put storage on top of it, then you're going to have to pay the price for it for now, at least. Yeah. So, so I think it's all about like trying to find the balance and then kind of moving forward from there. One of the things that I like a lot about Manta is um, like, like some of the, some of the, uh, you know, the things you have out there is like the focus on the developer ecosystem, because I mean, and, and actually the analogies you made to cloud computing, I think are great. And there is, you know, an argument for, I mean, even in the AI space, we talk about, you know, is the end compute, right? Or is it, how much of it is edge compute versus on-prem, on-premise compute. So uh, what I'd love to hear about is when you think about the developer ecosystem on things like L2s and on Manta, I guess, how important in that is that? And how do you get that flywheel effect, right? Where you get the users, I mean, there's not enough users that you talked about for it to be attractive, um, you know, for a lot of developers. Uh, but of course, the you know, if you look at like cohort metrics and things like that, you know, the dollar per user could be a little higher than perhaps traditional apps, but I'd uh, love to see how you think about making that flywheel effect happen. Yeah, I, I really like, you know, the, the metrics that you're kind of throwing in there because these types of KPIs and stuff, right? Like, to be completely honest, they're not, they're not thought about by developers, right? They're thought about by product people. They're thought about by, you know, uh, the, the business ideas, right? And so, like, I think there is also a distinguishment between um, a, a, a product team and a developer team, right? And I, I do think like we see this a lot in the blockchain space, which like, you know, for better or for worse, there again, there needs to be a balance, but sometimes, right? Like we, we tend to build things, we tend to build technology for the sake of technology. But I think we're transitioning out of that to start building technology for the sake of product. And product is what attracts users, right? I could sit here and talk about zero knowledge proofs to you guys all day. But like at the end of the day, no one's gonna no one's gonna care because no one knows how the heck to actually use that, right? But if I gave you a, a fully blockchain based poker game that you can play without having to worry about the underlying zero knowledge proofs, that's exciting, right? And I think like that's the kind of ecosystem that we're trying to build as mm -hmm. well, one that's more focused on product than technology. I, I want to go back just quickly, Eugene, and and I know I, I want to ask about the projects you have and what narratives excite you, Kenny. Um, you know, game is something I talk about a lot. DeFi is something as, as always mentioned. Um, so, social Fi is another interesting narrative. But Noah, I want to get your thoughts on L2s in general. And, and I know Nick, David, and Carol, I want to get your thoughts afterwards on, on, on L2s again, but whether, whether people outside of our little community are paying attention to it yet. But Noah, we'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, of course. Um, so I think, I think Matty nailed it eventually we will have this world of interoperability and multi-chain and multi-L2 where you can even transact with uh, L2 number five from L2 number two um, seamlessly, but we're not quite there yet. And I think that L2s are a great uh, solution at the moment for scaling Ethereum. I think that uh, with proto dank sharding and uh, having those transactions come down even more, they'll be the go-to for retail users that want to play around with the EVM. And whether people like to admit it or not, I know there's Solana Maxis and um, uh, Cardano Maxis, but the EVM has a strong first mover advantage. And one of the questions I had for Manta and other L2s is, like, if you look at L2B, for example, and you look at Arbitrum, they, they make up 50% of the, the market share. And uh, I'm always curious to know like how up and coming L2s like Manta are planning on distinguishing themselves from the rest of the pack. I know Metis recently chose to decentralize their sequencer, and I think that other L2s are following that suit. But I really want to know what distinguishing qualities uh, Manta has in order to attract some of that developer community, attract some of that liquidity, and kind of make a name for themselves. I mean, I do see that you guys are catching up to um, I think Metis it is, and you guys have overlapped base, but it's still a very small percentage of the market share. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the L2B data that you're looking at, because the, it's, it's not entirely uh, clear just by looking at the pure number there. If you dissect it a little bit, you'll realize, for example, like Metis, right, like a lot of that TVL, which is, I guess I'm, I'm assuming that most people in the audience know what TVL is. It's just basically the amount of asset value that's locked on the network that people have basically brought onto the network. So we see around like 991 million in assets on Metis. Of that 991 million, right, a significant part of that is also their own token, right? And so I, I do think like, you know, the, the market cap of your own token 
on your L2 also contributes significantly to that TVL. And I think when you extract that value from the equation, then it's a much more even playing field, right? Like for us, for example, right? Like we ran um, the new paradigm campaign, which went completely viral all over Twitter. And that attracted around 800 million an external TVL into the network uh, over the course of like a couple of months. And so from there, right, like what we're really focused on is how do you how do you actually mobilize this TVL? Because at the end of the day, I think TVL is just a vanity metric, right? Like you can you can pump your chest and say how big your numbers are all day, but it doesn't matter. I think what matters is what are people doing with it, right? And so when you actually look at the on-chain activity, right, I think that indicates the the growth of the network, the health of the network. We might be getting a little bit into the detail here, but you know, all I want to say is like that's the number we need to be focused on like that's the that's the organic growth that we're going to see on chain and that's definitely something that we're we're keeping an eye on sure sure so i mean look, let's look at 24 hour volume for example arbitrum has almost 500 million the the second in line um as far as layer twos go because polygon's not a layer two it's a side chain is optimism at 50 million so again i, I i'm very curious to know because i love mantas branding um, I participated in the the airdrop stuff, but um, I would love to know what you guys have planned in order to attract users, in order to attract volume, activity, uh, all those important metrics that you just highlighted. Yeah. So going back to you know the the TVL that we've been able to essentially manage to bring in for the past couple of months, right? Like that's the that's sort of the first chapter of I think a typical L two network growth, right? And at least ours, right? So the first part is just bringing in all the volume, bringing in all the users, and then the second part is actually being able to place them into applications for them to try out and start building the liveliness of that network, right? I think a lot of these ecosystems that I that are currently exploding in terms of on-chain transaction volume, right? Like if you look at these things, yeah, sure. Like there's some application interaction, but a lot of it is based on like the culture within the, uh, the ecosystem itself. And when I say culture, I mean, you know, one of those aspects is meme coins, right? Like people are trading meme coins all the time because that's something that is really exciting for, you know, everyone in the ecosystem. It's fun to do, right? You, you win some, you lose some. I'm not endorsing it, right? But the point is, the fact of the matter is a lot of the volume comes from that type of activity. Kenny, what, do you, think, something what do you think the, like the ultimate, I'm just curious, what do you think the ultimate like killer app, right, uh, will be, right? Because if you think about things like stable coins, USDC, Tether, you know, obviously I think that it's very obvious what the, the um, you know, the, the killer app for those are, but when it comes to, you know, L2s on EVMs, what's your, I and mean, what's your projection there? And I'd love to also bring in the rest of the panel, you know, Carol, David, Nick, we'll, we'll go to you after, but Kenny, I'd love to hear what you think, like number one uh, shot a killer app is. Ooh, yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's a it's a pretty loaded one. Um, you know, it really is depends it? on which. <laughs> I don't know. I, don't know. I, don't know. I feel like I'm it really curious. depends on which industry you're in, especially especially as the founder of an L two network that you know attracts all sorts of different apps. <laughs> no, I'm not in a position where I have to say which one is gonna, you know, which I think is. <laughs> but that being said, right, like it's um, I I think like the the strongest case for Web three, in my opinion, is globalization. I think that's what we're missing a lot in, even in the Web2 space, even in the Web2 internet space, right? Like, I don't know how much, how many of you guys like interact with apps and stuff in different countries, but like the very simple example of this is like, you go to the Western world, you see Uber, you go to, you know, the Middle Eastern world, you see Kareem, you go to the, um, the Southeast Asian world, you see Grab, you go to China, you see um, you know, um, uh, oh my God, I can't remember it. But the point is that there's so many different apps, right? And then on the financial side, it's even worse, right? Like you can't pay someone over in China with PayPal, just like you can't, well, now you can, it's a little bit more international, but you know, back then you couldn't really pay people with WeChat pay or Alipay or something, right? Like there's, there's financial barriers that are geographic that I think can be basically, um, gotten away with with uh, Web3, right? Like you, you can do away with all these sort of bordered transactions and create borderless transactions. And I think that has a significant impact on the global economy, especially when you bring in such things as like real world assets. And now you have access to real world assets all around the world without any sort of bordered payments. Oh, super interesting. So payments is kind of the, the, the punchline. It's a really interesting perspective. I love that. Nick, uh, you want to jump in? Yeah, I'd love to hop in and talk about payments, too, because I think payments are the killer app for Bitcoin as well. And when we look at what are, what's the most successful second layer on Bitcoin, it's Lightning Network. 
But the asterisk is that Bit, uh, Bitcoin's Lightning Network is only about one to two hundred million dollars in size compared to Bitcoin's nine hundred billion market cap. So less than one basis point of Bitcoin is locked in Lightning Network, but Lightning Network is facilitating transactions. So taking it all the way back to why L2s are important, it goes back to protocol stacks. And that's how technology is built out. You can even think of HTTP, the protocol that we use for the web, as a second layer of TCP IP, which is the routing of the data packets itself. So the success of the layer protocol, which is the base layer, is the determinant factor on whether we should even explore a second layer. And with Bitcoin and its and the critique that the correct critique that it takes between 10 minutes and an hour to confirm a transaction properly we need the killer app for bitcoin which is to use it instantly lightning network is yet another protocol it's not a company or uh, or a single app it is a protocol that is a set of standards that many apps are building with that allow the instant transfer of bitcoin once again once you're using the Lightning Network, which requires an on-chain transaction in the first place. Yeah, and but Nick, there's, in that there's way, that, we, Nick, question for you on that. Though. There's a bifurcation, by the way, between you know the you know, store value, as we talked about earlier, and number two, the application layer, right? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about interoperability, which could stall that eventually. But right now, it seems clear that Bitcoin is the store of value, has, has sort of, you know, has, has a gridlock on the store value uh, use case, at least as of now. And the application layer is kind of, you know, up there, but obviously, you know, uh, Ethereum and layer twos are kind of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, taking that pie. So what do you think of that? The yeah, payments are not, the are not the killer value, app on Bitcoin anymore. Not yeah, for a long store, time. Store of value is what the Bitcoin protocol was designed with. It's meant to be a value transfer protocol. And in that way, Hey, hey, Nick, Bitcoin is, is, is Nick cutting off anyone else? Because yeah, 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 he's on the way. Yeah, he's back. Hey, he's Nick, back. I, right. Yeah, yeah. So you know, it's it is. Hey Nick, I think you're having some connection issues. It sounds like a. Uh, I would love to hear what you're saying, but maybe fix the connection issues. And we'll get you. We'll get you back. But Maddie, did you say something? I I heard you jump in on this. Um, and then yeah. We'll go to Carol and others, but yeah. So Bit Bitcoin was it started out as you know peer to peer cash, peer to peer money. Um, but since, since Satoshi left, it, it has morphed into something else, um, and morphed into more of a store of value. Uh, you can't, I mean, you, it, it, it's not really possible for it to scale in the way that, uh, you know, the Bitcoin cash people wanted it to. Um, and, and the, the network as a whole, or the consensus of the network has decided to transition Bitcoin into more of a store of value. So that's like really the gold standard at the moment not just a store of value, even a store of data. I mean, you don't have a more secure way. If you wanted to, to, to inscribe something on Bitcoin, I mean, it, it'll last very likely forever or, or for as long as we're maintaining this technology of Bitcoin, which, which could be hundreds of years. And I don't think there's another way of really storing something, something publicly like that. Payments, I, you, you can't use Bitcoin for payments right now. It's just, it, 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 it really is ridiculous. If you want, it, if you want a payment to go through, in under an hour at the moment you're paying upwards of like twenty five dollars at that point at that point you know you you you're you're you you're much better off like using um you know uh some some side chains i think i'm not gonna name any names at the moment but um those those are much much better for payments uh mm -hmm. right now interesting carol what's your perspective on this hey, we're, we're going down a rabbit hole that uh is probably the most misunderstood rabbit hole that exists in crypto um, I've been there from almost the very beginning and had come to the table with a lot of experience in, in payments generally before Bitcoin ever hit the, the scene. Um, and from the beginning, you know, there was this talk, oh, Bitcoin is a currency. And I kept looking at it and saying, no, it's not really a currency. Yes, early days, it was sort of used as a currency, especially when the price was, you know, very, very low. Uh, and it was usually used by those, uh, I, uh, my my favorite stories are really sort of the some of the titans in, in crypto now were just really 
uh, probably preteens um, <laughs> uh, when this all started. And they were able to create some value out of almost nothing and uh, other than their, their electricity. And they could use that value to purchase things online that they might not have been able to get money from mom and dad otherwise to do so. So that was the closest we came to currency. Um, a lot of the early apps, a lot of the, the entrepreneurial spirit was around creating the payments apps. And some of the things have survived over time and we could talk about those, but, but you know, that, that, but the whole, what the last several years have been or last 10 years, especially the first sort of five or six years in that time period um, was really trying to make this, this cryptocurrency more accessible to the average person. Um, uh, and we're, we're getting closer and closer all the time and certainly Lightning Network and a number of the different kinds of apps that are out there that make it easier for the average person to access uh, the value and use it. Um, the best I think you can ever say about Bitcoin is that maybe is it base money? Um, that sits there, and I th and you know there's some folks early in the early days who were saying this is going to be the base money. Um, is it the network effect that we're talking about? Um, but what we're really talking about at the technology, and I think that's where the layer twos come in, the L twos come in, is that we're getting closer and closer to being able to use this technology to facilitate um, the kind of payments that we want to see happening. And we have to really sort of divorce that from the coins themselves, uh, from the tokens. Um, and and once you yeah, so Carol, are you are you suggesting so you said that there's been a lot of attempts at payments, which I totally agree with, but are you suggesting that that there's gonna be continue to be failures or that the use of L2 will there will be some point where that will be the breakout uh, sort of killer app, so to speak? Um I would say that it's a continuing it's a continuum of experimentation <laughs> and and until we get to one that actually works uh, or you know mm -hmm. is working on a great deal of regularity. I think the stable coins have taken us the closest to you know having a currency that's operating on these kinds of networks. Why? Because the what do you think, what do you think holds it back? What holds back USDC and Tether? Is it the crypto to fiat uh, conversion or? What do you mean? Like, what, why is, yeah. um, I mean, if you look at the transactional volume. You said we we said we came it came the closest, but I mean, if you look at the total value locked, I mean, it's pretty. Um, I mean, you look at that versus other L two. Well, or, first L2s, of all, for example, you, you first some, of all, when you look at Tether yeah. in particular, you can't look at T TVL um, with respect to Tether. You have to look at the circulation. How much of of t Tether is circulating per day? There were times earlier, you know, a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, where Tether's you know uh, capitalization or TVL, whatever you want to use the reference. Um, um, was circulating three, four X a day. Um, and that's when you have a real currency and that's when you're going to move forward on payments. When we start talking about payments, there's a lot of different moving pieces to payments. You know, one's how you interact with the, with the app that you're using, um, what kind of rails you're using, what kind of value you're moving across it. Um, so it's not an easy open and sh uh, shut case. And I think the nirvana of, of you know, this, this crypto layer two solutions uh, being payments, um, uh, it's not so simple because payments is a heavily, heavily regulated space. And uh, while the technology may help the payments uh, uh, accelerate to being, you know, much more um, um, effortless, um, uh, there's still regulatory uh, barriers uh, that are often country by country. Um, so there's some some significant hurdles in this point. process. Interesting points. I actually want to really want to get Kenny's thoughts on what Carol just said, because Kenny, you made a great point, I thought earlier about globalization and globalization of payments. And Carol's bringing up things like, well, you know, just because you can do a payment, there's regulatory hurdles. So we'd love to hear about the, uh, the feedback to that. I mean, Carol's Carol's definitely the expert here in terms of regulatory hurdles, right? Like, I, I'm not going to try to moonlight as a lawyer on this space. I think that, you know, like, it's definitely a need, right? Like, and, and exactly how we get there on the compliance side, right? Like, I don't, I don't know if I have too much comments on that. <laughs> At least if I do, you guys actually, uh, do, do you guys, Ken, Ken, I'm, actually, I'm, actually, I'm actually curious. Do you guys have concerns uh, seeing what the SEC, even the courts, are kind of siding with crypto, or at least being logical when it comes to crypto? Do you have concerns when you see? Um, all the big players getting hit left, right, and center, and CZ is still in the U.S. right now, not able to come back to Dubai. I think, Mario, though, it's important is to separate what's going on at the SEC from the conversation we're having about currency and payments, because it's really two different worlds that we're dealing with. 
Yeah, I'm going to shift you to the SEC world because it just a bit more, it kind of triggered that question. I know it's unrelated to the points you've made, Carol, but I got to trigger the question to see that. I haven't talked to any blockchains about this. I haven't asked them any questions in the future spaces as well if they come up. Um, is that you <laughs> looking at all the big players getting hit? Uh, does that concern them in any way? I think Kenny? I think the most I think the most concerning thing about all this is not you know the, just the big players kind of getting hit, but more so about the the, the lack of clarity. Right. I think the lack of clarity makes it very hard to fuel innovation, especially when it comes to, you know, looking at case studies from the SEC. Whereas you, I, I personally see a lot of innovation kind of fueled right now, a lot in the Middle East, a lot in Asia from the Web3 space, just because those types of environments are fostering this type of innovation with not 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 saying, hey, go do whatever you want. But by giving that regulatory clarity that I, I don't think that the U.S. has entirely given yet. Yeah, super interesting. Uh, Carlo, we'd love to also get your thoughts on this. Carlo, unmute on the lower left. Yeah, the question I have for you, Carlo, is the same one. Like, should, do you think L1s and L2s should be worried um, that they'll be cracked on as they get bigger? Always. <laughs> the short answer is always, because until we can run out the clock here and hopefully have a change in leadership at the SEC that is more receptive to, to crypto and blockchain innovation, I think we always have to be concerned there is still not a lawyer in the crypto space that I'm aware of who's going to comfortably give any opinion on whether any crypto application or currency launch constitutes a security or not, because we just have so much regulatory vagueness at this point. So this is and remains the greatest hurdle to innovation. We either need legislation to fix this, or we need more communication from the regulators that exist as to what the correct lanes are that these startups can navigate in. That's going to be the problem going forward. Kenny, I've got a, another question for you and that one for the, I'm going through the audience and I see a lot of faces, familiar faces that, you know, they go into our spaces that we do when we cover Gaza or when we're doing the, the Ukraine war, we're talking about uh, the Iowa caucus. And I'm, I'm looking at them, I can see like voice, I saw you give a love heart, for example, and I see others, many others in the audience. Um, and I'm like, they're, they're here listening to this technical conversation when it comes to layer ones, layer L ones, L twos, um, different narratives in the industry, legal hurdles, Bitcoin versus ETH and other blockchains. And I'm like, I'm fascinated. I'm actually humbled that they're interested, which is great. And I think they'll be more interested as as the price continues to improve. So I want to take this opportunity and, and I want to actually get the entire panel, starting with Kenny, to kind of appear perfect timing to come in. To kind of what message do you want to leave for the audience for people completely outside the industry? Probably a good place to kind of uh, kind of finalize the space. Like people completely outside the space um, to understand about the industry. And Kenny, maybe it's, it's a good opportunity for you to give your thoughts on that question and obviously kind of link it to Mantel, of course. Kenny, you there? I'm going to go to, to Carlo and Noah then um, until Kenny can unmute. Carlo, uh, what message would you want to send to the audience that has nothing to do with crypto? Uh, this is an outstanding opportunity to get on board with what I think is going to be the future of finance and of ticketing and of anything that we want to do in a fast kind and efficient of, uh, way. Space, right? Like the first one is in the cloud computing space. Uh, because think, I've yeah, been so in Okay, so I think Kenny, you're just glitching. Um, go ahead, Carla. Uh, so, so ticketing is last last point I heard. Ticketing. Yeah, Kenny look, I think you know to circle oh, back boy. to the topic. Sorry, layer twos and their relevancy. Um, I saw I, the the cloud uh, computing. Kenny, space. Kenny, <laughs> Kenny. I, I think there's a mic issue. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah, can Kenny. Can you hear yeah. Oh. I, I think there might be a glitch. I think Kenny might not be able to hear Carlo. It's a bug. Carlo. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, oh, you I know the bug right now. Yeah, all good. Okay, Kenny. So, Carlo speaking. You can't hear him. It's all good. Noah is the host, so he knows the, the glitch that happens a lot. So, Carlo, go ahead and let you finish it off. We'll go to, to, to Kenny afterwards and Noah. Thank you, Mario. I, I think that to circle back to the topic of the space, the future of, of, of crypto and L2s, L2s are critical because we have to have speed. I think the number one thing that's going to be required of this technology, if it's going to mainstream, is speed and ease of transaction. Now, I know that that comes with a sacrifice of security. And Bitcoin is and will always be the gold standard when it comes to that proof of work security. But when it comes to tokenizing assets, when it comes to tokenizing securities, as Mr. Fink is suggesting, you're not going to be able to achieve that type of transaction speed unless you have a L2 that is both secure to the extent that it can be and reliable. Everything is going to be tokenized going forward, in my humble opinion. And I think for the people that are tuning in right now and are new to this, 
this is an outstanding time to educate yourself about the possibilities and the use cases for these L2s. Mario, we've talked about gaming. That is another major industry. We've talked about zero knowledge proof and confirming people's identity. This is all going to be part of a very seamless web of blockchain technology that I think is going to dominate the future. I know I'm biased in that respect, but that's my feeling. I think anyone on stage is going to is, it could, could be considered uh, biased. <laughs> uh, but, but we'll go to, to, to Kenny. Uh, Mike is yours. Your message to people in the audience that have nothing to do with crypto. And obviously link it to Manta as well. Oh, shit. Kenny oh, can't yeah. even hear can me. Can oh, no, he can. Hear. Oh, he can. Yeah, Kenny he can. He can. Yeah. can you guys hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Yeah. Cool. So um, I personally, my take is blockchain Web3 is inevitable. I've seen the technology space evolve in various different industries. I was in cloud computing back in 2011 when people were saying cloud computing is a bubble. No one's going to believe in cloud computing. Everyone's still using data centers and, you know, bare metal. And then bam, fast forward to now, I can't imagine any single app, any single product, any single company not using cloud computing, right? Like it's, it's pervasive. There, there hits this moment where there's just no looking back. I saw that with cloud computing. We saw that with even Twitter. Right? Like when Twitter first came out, who gave two, two seconds of attention to Twitter? Only teenagers did, right? No one cared. But then all of a sudden, right, you see, you know, a, a few presidential generations later, and we're creating international relation crises with Twitter, right? And so like, there's, again, no, a, a point where you just can't look back. I think Bitcoin and blockchain has crossed that path as well, right? We've just secured ETFs, right? Like this is, this is a point where we don't look back. And so inevitably, right? Like this space is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And so the, the biggest opportunity right now is where is that growth headed? And I personally believe that that is heading towards the L2, right? Like that's the space that we're very dedicated to. And I think that's the game that we want to play. And I think eventually, right? Inevitably, it's going to have to be played in the blockchain space. So like, yeah, we've, we've gotten to the point where we can't look back anymore. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Kenny. Um, Peter, what is your uh, what is your message to the audience? Peter, you got on mute, bottom left corner. Otherwise, I'll go to Carol until Peter can unmute and go. Hey, Maddie sorry. Unmute. Yeah, sorry. I got. Can I can I hop the line in? But I got. Yeah, go ahead, Maddie. Yeah, we'll go. Two yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Maddie. Yeah, um, go ahead and we'll go to Carol. First of all, love love your neighbor. That's my message to the world today. Somebody tweeted to me um, while we were on this space. They said. You're a lying fucking faggot. Um, and then in my DMs earlier this morning, somebody said, pathetic little prick. I don't, I don't know these people. Like, you, 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 what's the, what, somebody asked, what's the killer app on blockchain? Okay, killer app on blockchain, um, you know, is, 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 moving, is moving the world forward. Okay, it's, it's basically just taking the internet, the freedom of, of knowledge, and and pushing it to the next uh, the next stage uh, the next place which is the the, the freedom of value okay and um we're the what was the first use case of the internet okay the first use case of the internet was gambling and porn okay and look where we've come from there to like where we are today it's basically an evolution and sometimes there's like dirty things that happen uh on twitter and sometimes people get angry and they post weird messages um, but my message is to the world, be the change that you want to be and um, bring light into this, into this situation and maybe a little bit of humor. And that's going to change things in a profound way. Thank you for having me on Thanks. today. Thanks, Matty. I think that, that these are the messages I'd usually expect to when I'm when we're doing covering the war in Gaza or something. But uh, I think it's it's a message. We, we, I'm in Israel. We could do that a different. We could do that a different. Oh, okay. Day. Oh, uh, I had no idea. Yeah, there you go. I, I'm used to those messages. Then, um, <laughs> Carol, I think it's a perfect perfect message when it comes to the war. But Carol, um, uh, would love to get your message to the audience and and also focusing on um, just the misconceptions when it comes to crypto. I think you'd be perfectly positioned to, to talk about that. Well, that's exactly, there's lots of different threads around crypto and blockchain. And I often say, put these things in different buckets uh, and then we can pick up a bucket and we can talk about what's going on in that particular bucket. So we've talked about cryptocurrencies as currencies, as payment mechanisms. Um, we've talked about blockchain as technology. 
Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that blockchain is already, blockchain DLT type technology has already been embedded in a lot of tech stacks in a lot of different kinds of companies around the world. And it's stuff that we don't, we don't see and we'll never see. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily involve cryptocurrencies and so on. Um, a lot of a lot of time, a lot of effort has been spent in the press on, you know, a couple of particular threads, including, you know, is it a security or is it not a security? Um, you know, is it a currency, not a concern currency? People are concerned about the value. But I uh, echo what Carlos said is that this is a fundamental shift in, in technology. Uh, I've been involved with the banking system, the TradFi, with the payments area. Um, what this technology offers is the ways to correct those different technologies uh, or correct the, the infrastructure around uh, these different industries. Uh, and so one has to keep their mind open uh, with respect to uh, the developments that are going to happen in this area. And hopefully we can do a better job of sort of policing the bad actors in, in this process. I think it's great. Noah? Yeah, what do I what do I follow up with? Those are all some great points. I think Mario's profile says unbiased or no bias, no echo chambers. It's a bit of an echo chamber and it's a bit of bias, but I think the reason the bias is there uh, partly is because we're all invested, but the other part is we all see how um, amazing this technology is and how the paradigm is shifting before our very eyes. And I would say to someone getting in the space for the first time, in my opinion, this is this could be the, the one of the biggest or the biggest asymmetric bets that you can make. I would make sure that you're following the right people, that you're watching the right content, because there's a lot of bad content out there. There's a lot of good content out there. I'm not going to show anything. I mean, uh, the amount of information available today versus in 2017 when I just was, was getting started is, is like night and day. There's so much great literature to digest. There's a lot of great people to connect with. And so if you just spend time or even have the opportunity to go full time into crypto and learn about how this tech works and where to make those bets, it could be uh, it could be life changing, in my opinion. So I'll leave you with that. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Noah. Kenny, I want to give you the final word on this uh, just really um, awesome space. Uh, learned a lot. Um, but what do you want to leave people with about Manta specifically? Um, yeah, I think especially with the audience in this space right now, right? Like you think ultimately, you know, one of the missions here at Manta is really just thinking about social impact, right? Like right now, of course, we are in the early stages of kind of building out the entire ecosystem. And as part of that, right, you've got to go through the proper hygiene of doing so. But I think like in the long term, sort of ingrained in the founder's vision is definitely one of more of like a global scale social impact, right? I mean, my, myself, I was, um, you know, gra I graduated from MIT Sloan back in 2020. I was actually the uh, teaching assistant for Gary Gensler back then when he was teaching his crypto courses. And so like definitely thinking a lot on like the, the compliance side as well. Hold on, hold on. So the, pause, uh, pause, pause, <laughs> Hold on. You can't let that slip, <laughs> slip past us. So tell us more. So does he, what does he really think about crypto? What did he really think about crypto? You have to tell us what Gensler really There's thinks. nothing. They're, the writing's on the wall, right? I mean, this guy is, he's not pretending. Like, I mean, I think the way that he interacts with the world right now, the way that he's thinking and the way that he's, you know, presenting himself is exactly how he thinks, right? I think like this is a, you know, a, with all due respect, a very honest man uh, in terms of like his thought process, right? And so like, I, I don't think, you know, he's held any sort of different opinion at any other point in time, especially not when I uh, knew him. Well, actually, uh, so following on that, Kenny, I mean, there's, there's, you know, frequent thoughts. I mean, this is maybe groupthink in the crypto world that, oh, he was like a little more pro crypto when he was teaching at MIT. Do you think that that's not true? Um, I, I personally don't really think that that was true because, you know, he, he has taken uh, things purely from a security lens, right? It's really, I think it's always been a question, right? And, and as one should in his position, right? Like, Think about like, okay, how is this not a security, right? Like, I mean, if, if I was in his position, like I'd be looking at the chicken on my table and wondering if it's a security or not, right? Like that's, that's his entire job. And so I do think like that, that bias has always been sort of, you know, inherent. Um, and, and so like, you know, for better or for worse, that, that, that is what it is. <laughs> I mean, you know, regulation through enforcement. I mean, it's, uh, it, I mean, there's also the, the tenor, right? There's the one thing about like, does do things pass the Howey test? 
right? Relative to, I mean, you know, you taught a crypto course, right? Was it like kind of, what, what was the feeling inside the course? Was it, was it generally anti-crypto? Uh, it was pure curiosity. It was so interesting. Yeah, that I think is, uh, I think that was one of the really like, special aspects of the course, right? Like, I don't, I think that Gary had his own opinions and his own sort of biases, but he never let those sort of flow into the perspective of the, the, the materials that like, you know, the, the, the students consumed essentially, right? I think like the, the classes themselves were pretty objective. And in fact, like, I think a lot of these students that are graduating from Sloan, especially during that time, who have made their way into all these sort of Web3 projects, um, have learned how blockchain works, have learned how proof of work works, through Gary, like this guy knows his stuff. When I was there, like I've never, I've never seen someone read, consume as many white papers on crypto projects and blockchain projects as he did, right? So like this, this guy definitely um, understands, you know, everything that's going on. I think from the from the perspective, right? He just he he brings in the the, the security lens. Yeah, there's so much irony and so much so many things to unpack in here. But uh, Mario, anything else before we end the space? No, it's pretty much out. Uh, Peter, are you back with us? I think you're having me issues uh, unmuting yeah. your mic, um, Peter. All right, you there? I, I think yeah, well, I'm here. Yeah, you are. Yes, you are. Uh, the, the, I know you came in late. Just want to get your thoughts. So we do have an audience that's very varied, um, and not, a lot of people are not inside of crypto, and I, I was surprised that they're listening to us. What would you say is the biggest misconception or the biggest message you want to leave to people outside the industry when it comes to crypto? Well, you know, you're getting in the layer two stuff, which is frankly way over my head, but I think it is the future. I think the functionality of crypto, my focus is basically Bitcoin and is basically store value. I mean, that that's where I live and sleep and think about is, is what store value look like going forward. Uh, when we get into functionality and layer two stuff, I absolutely believe that it, it holds the future of, uh, international finance is going to be tied to it, but uh, I, I think others are better to speak to that. No, so your message didn't have to be linked to, to layer twos, but I think you've made it clear. Bitcoin is seen as a store of value, and that narrative is gaining more and more traction. And the ETF launch is obviously uh, um, kind of the, the, the trophy we've all been kind of waiting for, the badge of honor that we wanted to have when we go to Wall Street and speak to the people that are hating and shitting on crypto. Um, but I think it's, it's a good message to leave it with. I uh, uh, appreciate everyone coming on. Uh, on a non-crypto related news, uh, we do have Iran who hit targets in, um, just literally 20 minutes ago, they hit targets in C in Iraq a couple of days ago. Now they just hit 20 minutes ago, reports of them hitting targets, missiles to targets in Pakistan, um, which I'm waiting for more sources to kind of confirm this because the, the Iranian foreign minister is meeting uh, a Pakistani minister right now, or potentially the prime minister, I'm not sure, in Davos as we speak. So it's just some weird stuff happening. So I look into this. Otherwise, it's a pleasure hosting Manta. On you know, congratulations, you guys are already in the top four in terms of TVL total value locked. In terms of layer twos, I'd say you're already in the top three because you haven't launched your coin yet. Um, so congratulations on that. Congratulations on the building you've done over the last two years. I appreciate you uh, partnering with us for the space and uh, appreciate the panel and the audience for coming in and, and sticking around for a technical discussion. Hope you found value in it. Thanks a lot, everyone. We'll see you again soon.